Hello, everybody. Welcome to our channel, Scientology Peeling the Onion. My name is Mark Fisher, and I'm here with Janice Gillum Grady. How are you doing today, Janice? Good, Mark. Good day, everybody. Welcome to Scientology Peeling the Onion. We've been having a lot of fun peeling the onion lately. I mean, mine yeah, has been peeling have. big time. Yeah, so it's been fun. <laughs> All right, and then why don't you go ahead and uh, we'll introduce our, our guest uh, today. Okay. And he's back by popular demand. I mean, he's, he's very popular and we're happy to have him. He's a good friend of ours. Yep. And without he's, further ado, we're really no, happy to have him. Wait. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I wanted to do a special announcement of him because okay. he's always been special to me. Um, when he was 14 years old, Paul and I became his legal guardians when we were in the Sea Org together. And so I always refer to him as my first son. So let's welcome Jackson, Gary Moorhead. Hello. Hey, hey, Jackson. How you doing, brother? Hey, Mark. Doing good, Daddy-O. Always good to see you. You're looking good, man. You're looking well, thanks. good. <laughs> Hi, Jackson. Hey, Mama. Hi, Janice. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to let everybody know in the chat, we see you there. We want to welcome the people that are here. We see Mary Kay London is here from Albuquerque. How you doing? Glad, wow. glad you're here. And uh, Clearwater Chad is in the house. Hi, Clearwater, Clearwater Chad. Chad. Hey, buddy. He's a cool cat. <laughs> yeah, he's very cool. And uh, what we're going to do is... Um, we're, we're just literally it's going to be an open forum, open discussion. You know, Janice uh, Jackson and, and I are going to speak, but also we're going to be popping up your comments throughout. We're not going to wait to the end to answer questions. So if you've got a question, go ahead and write question and, uh, yeah. and I'll, I'll start or I'll bring it up and uh, and we'll we'll talk about your questions. So you don't have to wait to the end for us to start answering your questions. We're going to do it starting right away. Uh, so if you have anything you want us to talk about or any questions, please ask question. If you want a super chat and super sticker, you can do that, of course. And we just asked everybody to be respectful. You know, I mean, it's just common courtesy. And uh, that's pretty much uh, what we've got going on. So yeah, Dan, we, you want, want this ball we want everyone. We want everyone part of the conversation here. So yeah. to get the ball rolling, I'm going to ask Jackson, who was security chief, when his adopted parents left the base. When Paul and I left, <laughs> you were security chief. And, and you know, we had been at that um, briefing when DM went psychotic in front of everybody at the gold base yeah, after the flood uh, the, the day on of the August flood. 11. Yeah, so he'd gone psychotic up there on the stage. And that's when, you know, I looked at Paul and he looked at me and I said, I'll take the car. And Paul's like, I'll take the motorbike. We both knew exactly what we were going to do. And um, the next day was when um, James Byrne and Greg Wilhair were going to be fired into gold on a mission. And all the penalties were, you know, you don't show up on time or you're late, you go to the RPF. Right and, away, I mean, yeah. it, it was so ridiculous. It was miserable. So, yeah. And so that night, when everyone was woken up around. 10, 11 o'clock at night to go into the base for a stupid drill. Paul and I, I already had it approved for me to take three days off to go visit my aunt and uncle who were coming over from Australia. Oh, wow. but, Paul, but Paul was not approved to go with me. He had been approved, but because of the flood, it was said he can't go with me. So that's when I told Lisa Schroer when she's like, well, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I'll figure something out. Don't worry. And that's where I'm like, I'm out of here. Yeah. There's too much control of my life. So <laughs> when everyone was being put, getting onto the bus to go into the base back at 11 o'clock at night, Paul and I loaded up the car with some things and told everyone that, he, that I was going to drop him off at the base on my way to go pick up my uncle and aunt. Well, instead of taking the right turn to the base, we took a left turn and headed out of there see ya <laughs> see ya yeah and so nobody knew until the next morning probably when i guess paul didn't show up for muster or something like that yeah there was a there was a time gap simply because of all the diverted attention to the significance of the newfound lower condition gold found itself in as a group and all the stipulations and restrictions that came with it. And we took a beat down the first night, um, like you said, being brought back in. And 
I just significantly remember how miserable that was. So yeah, um, it was a bit of relief to hear, hey, I get to get diverted off of all this and go find and deal with Paul and Janice. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit of well, a so, relief. It was doubly it was doubly bad because I left that night too. I took yeah. off as well. Yeah, I know. So it was probably like it was a know, double whammy. What they call it? Hilt- what uh, red alert, red alert. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. In the Sea Org terms, it was called the Hill 10. And yeah, I, I yeah. never knew the, the origin of such a statement, but yeah. But Mark, you stupidly went back. We didn't. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah they, well, we, we get to happily tell ourselves that now. Well, you stupidly went back. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, there was an advantage to you going back because that's how you found out Paul and I had left and that right. there wasn't anything wrong with you and that you left right. again. Yeah. Yeah, Mike Sutter told me that when he when they recovered me in L.A. and drove me back. He said, oh, Paul and Janice Brady left last night, too. And I was like, OK, that was a mistake because now I know I, I have some place to go if I if I leave again. <laughs> yeah, I even remember making uh, I I used to try to see, find you guys standing in the booth, Janice. I used to make phone calls all the, on my little ability to find people. Yeah, I was, I was doing it heavily on the slide. Like, how can I find them? I would. I was calling Yellow Pages, you know, at the time, what was available publicly. Um, but I was trying to find out, I was trying to remember your maiden name, you know, your middle names, and uh, the whole nine yards without being obvious or being caught, trying to find out where Janice and Paul went. I just And you, just, uh, you were trying to find us to bring us back? Well, no, I, I just, I never knew where you guys ended up landing. I knew you guys were gone and we had to find you, but that, you know, that wasn't too hard to find you guys because I'm going to say within 48, 72 hours, you guys are already back at the base of the U-Haul. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> you had all your we're stuff. We're coming to get our stuff. Yeah, no, you guys, you guys dictated the show. Uh, Sutter and everybody else involved was just the middle people answering to Dave of, you know, passing your demands on and, this is the way it's going to be. And then them, the church having to give back their response to your statements and how basically everyone's going to be happy that w- but you guys are leaving. You know, that was the problem that that was always an undertone taste of, especially of people of your caliber, you know, the significance yeah. of, of, uh, your guys's departure. Um, it, it pretty much the ball was in your guys's court yet. Nobody would ever say that if that makes sense. No, whereas right. in anybody else uh, that would leave that I would chase and bring back, the ball was certainly in the churches in yeah. the church's court. And uh, the people knew that once they came back to the base, they had no say it was just complete victim state of mind, wet dog behind a, the stove type of existence where you guys are like, Nope, 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 Nope. This is our way of the highway type thing. So, and you guys weren't well, being re- bad about it. It just, no, no. It was just the, no, the I, strength it takes to maintain that and and to get it through them, you know, the, washing the fear from your soul of, well, I can't ask for that. No, you guys had apparently, in my perspective, had the freedom. Yeah, I want this. I want this. And if I don't get it, this is going to happen. And, you know, you guys were already gone, gone. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I remember after being gone three days, we called Lisa Schroer, and that's where she said, well, where are you? We've been calling all the hospitals trying to see yeah. if you were a Jane Doe. And um, yeah, I'm like, no, we're, we're fine. We're just, yeah. we're done. And she's like, well, you need to come in and route out. And we're like, why? We're already gone. And she's like, because you need to get sec checked so you can get cleaned up before you leave. And we're like, no. <laughs> We're not coming back to get sec checked. We are moving on with our lives. We are done. Yep. And yeah. I certainly and remember then, yeah. that, Janice. It was, go ahead. And no, then Janice, we, yeah. do, you, do you remember if it was, was it Paul or you that called? Paul did the call. Okay. I said, I'm not, I'm not dealing with that crap. You can deal yeah. with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. That's- Funny. It truly is so nice to laugh about that very tra- traumatic <laughs> moment back then because it was for both sides of the coin. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we've got a yeah. question here uh, regarding this. This is from Pick 61 question. I don't think I've heard the story of when Dave went psychotic. Is there a link to the full story on that? On our channel, actually, absolutely there is. It's me and Jackson talking about my escape, and it's on our channel, and it's you can find it on our page, and it's 
uh, my escape from Scientology. And it's we did a good two hour video uh, on that. And so if you'd like to watch that, just go to our channel and uh, we go into detail regarding that. So thank you very much for that question. But generally, just to answer your question, because that's going to take some time to pass that, uh, pursue and locate that. Um, yeah. What was her name that were that question? Pix, Pix uh, 61. Hiya, Pix 61. Um, that was a very, th that, that day of uh, August 10th, 1990, at approximately um, one o'clock in the afternoon, a thunderstorm rolled through the property. And um, everybody was doing their normal Sea Org activities. I, I, at the time, was watching somebody, somebody from uh, spiritual, a Church of Spiritual Technologies from CST up, on, up in the San Bernardino Mountains where Shelley's claimed to be. One of their staff, I was watching them at the time at MCI, and it just started pouring, like literally coming off in a complete sheet of water off the roof of the lodges down around Massacre Canyon, Inn, which is where we ate. And um, it just, we were in, inundated with just a, the severe downpour. It must have been two to four inches in an hour type of experience, a lot of thunder and lightning. Anyways, as a result of that, we had a flash flood come out of the mountain that the international base is at the base of, which is geographically, the mountain's called North Mountain out in the San Ysidro Hemet Valley. And it funneled right down and washed across. It brought a lot of debris with it, washed across the highway from the north side to the south side out where our um, we basically housed visiting guest um, dignitaries and high-end uh, celebrities and stuff like that. And um, in the G units, what we called the G units, and... It, it washed out my security fence and gate and continued on and then washed through the the crawl space of the buildings. It never entered the buildings. It just ruined the landscape, and uh, it was close of destroying actual real, real estate. But anyways, here I had a big open hole in my perimeter now that I just couldn't go <laughs> pick the fence up and put it back <clears throat> in place. This is going to require 24-hour physical security till we get this done, and... And there was other incidents around the property, a lot of water running down in places. And, you know, even into Dave's miscavages, little Apple Box Boys personal residence, that is where water did enter and went into a storage area and his laundry from little, little kitchenette area. And um, so it intruded upon his. And of course, anything that intrudes upon, upon his environment, it's just utter tragedy. So, um, yeah, Dave well, let me really, comment. Really... Go ahead. Let me comment on that. Um, a plan had been submitted to do a hundred-year flood. You flood know, plan, yeah. Flood plan to, and landscape everything. So if there was, when the hundred-year flood happened, we were prepared for it, and the damage wouldn't happen. But right. Miscavige did not approve the hundred-year plan and approved a ten-year plan instead. Right. So it was actually his responsibility and fault on the damage that was created that he ended up trying to blame all of gold staff and the commanding officer Wendell Reynolds for. He didn't try to blame. He did blame. He did. He <laughs> did. <laughs> and, yeah. and just so people understand this hundred year flood plan, it is a, a, a plan to accommodate a flood that happens once every hundred years. And like right. Janice says, it was actually modified to a flood that happens once every 10 years and the t difference between a 10 year flood plan and a hundred years a 10 year would be maybe five inches of rain in an hour where a hundred years could be a hundred inches of rain in a day and uh right. so you'd have a much heavier a significant plan to work out with a hundred year plan as opposed to 10. so i just want to yeah. help you guys better yeah, no, understand thank you that, no that's a good that's a good explanation yeah. you know during that flood during the downpour i was actually riding my motorbike out towards <laughs> the g's and i was looking for somebody and it was so bad and so windy i had i yeah. had to find a bush and pull up behind it and hide behind the bush while yeah. i'm getting drenched because i couldn't the bike i just couldn't go on i was getting blown off yeah, it I certainly mean, it was, was intense. It was crazy. So, so yeah. to that lady, sixty-one Pixie, sixty-one, I believe it was. But yeah. Um. Uh. That's that. That's just a nutshell answer to your question to fill it in, and yeah, you'll, you'll and, get and more then he details. Went, and then he went psychotic that evening at yeah. six o'clock. He, he, he had, had everybody called the entire base, the entire the base down to the mess hall, 
and it was a big mystery as of what this is all about. We didn't even know it was going to be related to the flood. I mean, we knew it had to be something to do with it, but we didn't know what was about to be about to occur and how uh, 800 and I think at the time the head count for the base was 800, close to 900 total staff that actually resided at that place and called that place home. Um, oh my God, my phone call, my good old buddy, one of my good firefighters. I, that's a whole separate story. Um, oh, okay. uh, but, um, I, yeah, he's calling me. It's like, wow. Um, anyways, we being mustered down to that, it was just a room full of base executives and staff in a moment of silence. And he's just, this is why I call Dave Apple box boy. Cause when he enters the building, everybody stands at attention and you can't see him. <laughs> but you can hear him and then you finally get to see him when you hear the final clump clump up on to the apple box oh and that's why i call dave apple box boy because around that time everything hadn't been adjusted and rebuilt to accommodate his shorter stature so uh his assistants would carry apple boxes and an apple box is a device a tool used in the film industry that would bring people higher uh, to view, like if you're standing next to a short person, you could stand in the apple box and you both would look a proper on film. So there was a small, medium and big apple box and Dave always had a medium one, if I remember correctly, but nonetheless, you would hear him step up on the apple box, clump, clump. <laughs> and then uh, everybody would sit down and then it was only then you could see him. <laughs> oh, it sounds, dear. I mean, that is literally a true fact. Every time we had our base, you could never see him because he was so short when everyone's standing up. And all you can do is hear yeah. him. So your eyes would follow the sound up to the stage. And then the gold, all the gold crew had to stand in the front of the auditorium. Normally with the gold people would be in the back. Yeah. Now I wasn't just, there. I was up in the booth. I, so. I was there. Uh, we were yeah. there. We were right up front. I was standing next to Paul Grady, Janice's husband. Yeah. We never spoke. And Miscavige just went berserk. berserk. I mean, he literally was foaming at the mouth like a rabid dog. And, and disgustingly say. berserk. Like, yeah. I'm upset with you. It wasn't like, I'm upset with you people. You really disappointed me. No, you it's all your fault. All yeah. this rain, this flood is your fault. And guess what? You're going to have, you know, this is going to happen and this is yeah. going to happen and blah, 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 blah. And I'd worked for him, you know, daily for six years. I'd never seen him like that. Yeah. And I, uh, Paul and I, without ever speaking, both went, he has gone crazy. We have to get yeah. out of here. And then yeah. what did he do yeah. after all that? He goes up to his little officer lounge up there in the villas and plays a Nintendo Game Boy. Yeah. Where's Mario? The yeah. Mario. Yeah, that's what he did afterwards. Well, and he had gone on a roll about Wendell Reynolds. Wendell was in his white uniform and he was on a roll about Wendell staying inside the whole time. Well, usually when it rains or there's a storm, you do stay inside. Human beings do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> You seek shelter. Exactly. Yeah. Why why would you want to go outside and inspect the property when you can't even stand up against the wind? See, now in Wendell's mind, because you and I, we all know Wendell, right? In Wendell's mind, he's going like, well, you two asshole, look at your uniform. You didn't go outside either. You know, Wendell would say that to himself. If he <laughs> yeah. could voice it, he would have said it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So yeah. I've got to, go ahead. Are we done with that part? Or yeah. Yeah. Got another question yeah. For you? All right. Here's yeah, we our got next questions. Question. Question from Jehovah's Witness Apostate. Question, Gary. Uh, did you get to know Janice's mother? What did you think of her? Yvonne, and my uh, early, Yvonne, early, uh, I, I got to hang out with uh, Yvonne, like in 79 was the last time that I saw her um, in my first few years at the old uh, Celebrity Center, which was down off of um, Sunset La Boulevard, out much further. La Brea. La, La Brea. La Brea. That's La Brea. right, off of La Brea. Uh, That's right. But you've got your date wrong because she passed away in January 78. So it would have been before that. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, then, wow. See, this kind of stuff happens. Hey, we grew up in a cult. Our timelines are slightly <laughs> off and down. Um, I, well, maybe it was just her presence or the, the atmosphere was still full of her because I could have sworn I, I met and hung out with her, but it, maybe it was just um, the place was just so rip roaringly had a pulse yeah. i don't know i well, i, I felt manner, that i'd had huh the matter per lrh hubbard's instructions was supposed to be made a shrine for yvonne right that see i mean that yeah. just goes to show the atmosphere that, yeah that existed right. about so, her at the time 
at the manor, she'd set up the public relations organization and she had a whole bunch, a few offices there with her keys to the cities and photos with different celebs and the lounge for the celebrities and so forth. And see, Celebrity Center was still over on La Brea at the time, but yeah, it was supposed to become a shrine for, wow. of her, for her. Yeah. yeah, well, to answer that lady's question, I mean, obviously I had mad respect for her and she really, she was like the ultimate example of what Scientology was to afford people always very full of positive energy it was there there was no um shadiness to or undertone to her it was genuine honestly in love and interest in those that she interacted with in the things right. that she did her goal was always to make something better even if it was already good she would make it better if that was her responsibility or her interest she would wholeheartedly give in give to that so um yeah that's that's what I remember from being an absolute little punk way back then. Because <laughs> that well, was about the yeah. time we were building all the L. Ron Hubbard offices in the L.A. area, too. We were renovating them all and and um, had to go over the CC for something. Anyways. Yeah. So here's Sorry. another question also from Jehovah's Witness Apostate Janice about your mother. Was your mom ever sent to the RPF? No. No, um, when the RPF came about originally, well, she was always the commanding officer of Celebrity Center. And then when she got removed from that in um, 77 by an evaluation and false reports from the Guardian's office, uh, she was just sent to flag for training and did the, P the public relations course. And then she went and set up the public relations org. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, next question is from CC. Question: Where's the history of the advanced organizations being started? How many were there, and when? AOLI had several in 1977. Don't know till I heard the names here: Kenny Lipton, Claire Reppin, James Fuller. Man, well, we haven't, we haven't done any uh, video on the advanced orgs yet. We haven't gotten to that yet. Right, no, we, we haven't. We haven't. But there was, um, well, on the ship at the original advanced organization was on the Royal Scotman in, from November 67. And then when we got assigned liability in March of um, 68, it was moved ashore in Spain to Alicante. And then from there it went to um, AOSH Edinburgh because... Scientology was banned in England, so it was put in Edinburgh. And then there was, um, when the Class 8 course was done, uh, AO Los Angeles was set up, and also AOSH Denmark was set up. And those were wow. the three at that time. Yeah, we, well, we, had, we were going to do one in Greece, but then we got kicked out of Greece, and that's why Denmark got set up. Gosh, when I actually arrived at PAC in 1979, May 79, the fence, the chain link fence was still around the complex that was yeah. installed shortly after the FBI raid. Yep. Oh. Yeah, there was a chain link fence around the entire, uh, from LA Org around Big Blue itself, up Catalina, along Sunset, back down, which was, what was it, Berendo before it was changed? Berendo? Yeah, yeah I, I think That's right. so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, down to yeah. Fountain, and then uh, yeah. along Fountain. And that okay. was before it was even painted blue. It wasn't even blue then. That's right. No, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, I showed a photo. Here. I showed a photo of it in my in the running program video oh. of oh, the okay. building before it was blue. Yeah. All right. This is from Peter Anderson. Question for anybody: What do you know about the tunnel under Gil Gilman Hot Springs Road, public right away, well, connecting did. both sides of the Gold Base? Does the I county did. inspect the tunnel for safety? It wasn't there when we were there, Jackson. Yeah, no. That had to happen after that, we. That left. that was a long-term planned intention to reduce the risk to staff crossing the highway every day, three times a day for meals, um, because Highway 79, which is the it's a state highway at the time that ran right through the middle of the property that would take you off to the west or take you off to the east. One direction that you headed to Los Angeles, the other direction towards the east, you would head off into town. Right. And um, it was always a challenge. We actually had, I actually uh, had guards posted out there to help staff across the highway. Um, it was a to-do to cross the highway, especially as time went on and, and, and population increased locally. 
a lot more traffic was coming through. So when the when the it, it base itself is it was decided to um, do improvements and build it out to what you know it to be today, which is do a design. What are we going to do with this? Upgrade this, fix this, the the new interiors, the new exteriors, the new grounds, and all that. Part of that plan was we uh, um, had built and installed two tunnels, one through the main central, leading from where you see uh, pictures of the qualifications building that has the steeple and the cross with the stainless glass with the C or a Scientology symbol in it. Um, it's that that's the proximity of the north side of it, and the south side of it washes out into the court there's misha there's um, misha washes out to the south side of the property in front of massacre canyon inn which is where we ate around the flagpoles if you see any current photographs there's three flagpoles down there one american california and the sea york flag and uh, that's where it came out to and it was designed so it can uh, take care of foot and bike traffic because it was quite common for people to acquire little motorbikes and it was actually made big enough we thought forethought that it should be wide enough so you can actually travel through there in a golf cart i um, mean then go up uh, a golf cart ramp or you go up footsteps uh, on the north yeah, and side it, it was it was dangerous i mean oh yeah at meal times you'd have two three hundred people going across to mci to eat and then two three hundred coming back the other yeah. way no and more like basically four to five hundred cars people, are yeah. flying by right yeah yeah well, even when we first moved there in uh, the end of 78, early 79, uh, we didn't have the fence. We had no gates or anything. And my dog, uh, Babe, actually ends up getting hit by a car there while she was pregnant. And I remember having to grab her and rush her off to the vet. And I mean, she survived and she had 12 puppies. But um, who, who was Babe's it, baby it was, daddy? Oh. Uh, I don't know. Uh -huh. No, actually, actually, he, the baby daddy was uh, from the horse ranch behind us in La Quinta. She got pregnant oh, wow. in La Quinta. Oh, here's a story for you. Yeah, she got pregnant in La Quinta. And she was known by everybody at the base. And whenever I'd go up to rifle, babe Good would morning. always go with me. And when Hubbard would take his walk, if I was on watch, Babe would go for a walk with us. So he was familiar with who she was. Then wow. when we all moved to, to the new gold base in Hemet, um, summer headquarters, I was being told, Babe can't come with me. She had to stay at La Quinta where Maria Starkey was watching her for me because I'd been oh, on wow. mission. And so when I came back from mission, I'm being told, no, you can't get Babe. She's pregnant. I'm like, I know. So what? And nope, we're going to have no dogs here at this base. So when I went on my weekly watch at X where Hubbard was, I hit the recorder and I was telling him how Babe was pregnant and she's going to have puppies and I'm going to be bringing her from La Quinta to the new base. And so then he starts telling me, oh, okay, well then when they're puppies, make sure you feed them some eggs and make and feed them lots of protein. And I got this all recorded so that when I went back, I was like, LRH knows that I have a dog and that she's coming here and he remembers babe. So she's coming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah. So that's how I did it. Wow. That's a cool story. Cause I, I do clearly remember babe. I mean, there was two dogs um matt and amy uh, matt and mary pesh at the time who matt pesh was married to right. they had a dog named whiskey uh -huh. and uh and then there was also sherry Al aljabori's black lab which i'm trying to remember those are the three dogs distinctive dogs that that uh you just you ran forgot through. you forgot huh? suzette's dog beulah. Well, well beulah yes well yeah and she was a border collie mix or something like that yeah something like that yeah. And but yeah, an actual uh, house and the uh, Bonnie View house up where L. Ron Hubbard left was referred with with her that dog's name Beulah. That's was, right. Hey Jackson. Beulah. Yeah. 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 I have a question on that tunnel because we were gone when that was built. How long was the highway shut down? How long did it take to actually build those tunnels? Well, it was built at Sea Org Pace, so. Um, <laughs> Does that mean really slow? Yeah. No. Oh, no. Or, never... or overnight. Yeah. No. 
around the clock. <laughs> yeah, it was around Everyone the clock because because it was a state highway that had to be shut yeah. down. Um, you know, I actually have a hard time remembering the particulars of that event occurring, other than I remember, I do remember distinctly the day that's like, wow, there's an actual tunnel there now. We can actually go through it. That was before the concrete lining and the colored concrete was poured and put in and all the stonework. But um, when the contractors and those authorized such as security, not all general base staff could start walking through it. It was quite the cool, cool realization and a neat thing. So, yeah. Um, but that was, that was, uh, 89 1989 yeah no 1990 1990 no it had to be after yeah we left it was it was an early 90 yeah. yeah yeah i found a photo the other day that i should pull up and do a gold thing on where there was two women standing there and there was no fence and there was no tunnel at that oh, normal yeah. crossroad saw, yeah. oh wow yeah oh, wow. oh i remember that there were no uh, fence. Yeah. yeah that's right I just noticed you, you had earlier popped up that Laura FM was here. Hey, Lori. Yeah. And then yeah, uh, hey, Sarasota FM. Jerry. That's right. Yeah. But good old. How you little, doing, guys? Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, yeah. All right, here's, our ne- here's our next question here. Jehovah's Witness Apostate. Question, Gary. Were your parents Scientologists? Are they still in? Uh, back in the 70s, both my parents were. They were married at the time. We started down, our family started down in Orange County, California. It what was called at the time the Tustin Mission. Tustin, Orange County. Yeah. And uh, my dad fell out of favor with it. Um, uh, but uh, my parents divorced in late 78, 79-ish. And, you know, being so young, you don't really know what's going on and how things came about, the whys and wheres. But they were separated. And my mom continued going down there. And I found out much later on in my life, well into my mid-30s, how my dad fell out of favor with it. And, um, but my mom continued and she joined the Sea Org in 1979 and I followed her at my mom's direction. And that's where I ended up why I'm here today. <laughs> and your sisters, your sisters went in with her too. Yeah. They were on a delayed entry into the Sea Org simply because they were in the, it was soccer season out in Southern California. So for some reason I couldn't finish my soccer season, but my sisters were allowed to, and they stayed with friends. And then, uh, Cindy, she eventually joined staff in the sea organization. And, um, I think that's where, uh, she came to Janice. You got to know her a little bit, I think. Yeah. When um, she was at SMI. Yeah. And she was with this, this, um, Scientology Mission missions, Network. international, the mission network, the part of the sea organization that manages all the missions around the world, basically. Um, and, uh, my sister wasn't there too long. Her, she married, she married the twin. My sisters ended up marrying twin brothers, believe it or not. And um, not immediately, but my sister married this gentleman named Alan. And he was working at SMI in the Sea Org at the time. And they got pregnant. And um, they routed out. And uh, that was back in the 80s. And she, she's never returned. Living the Scientology public life. And um, my youngest sister... Um, through family interaction, fell in love with my older sister's husband's brother, who happened to be twins, and she married him, and yeah. Right, and then your dad yeah. happens to live in Las Vegas here. <laughs> my dad, the, 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 the interesting travels, unbeknownst to me, is my dad moved to and lived where I live now, and... uh he had retired as a police officer and privately he was hired by Home Depot. His Home Depot back in the day was being developed and expanding. He was hired as the head of security to oversee asset management um, and protection, basically, uh, overseeing all the central, southern, uh, southern, central, and, and northern, eastern Home Depots, a uh, northwestern. Home Depot. So he traveled all over the place, helped get all the Home Depot set up. And he ended up moving here to Oregon and um, ironically just down the street. And then uh, he uh, lost his second wife. He lived in Southern California. He moved to Las Vegas, ironically, right in the middle in between where Janice and her sister Terry uh, live. (laughs) And didn't even know that, but five minutes one way was Janice, five minutes the other way was Terry. 
and just for in my world i just like wow this is just so fascinating how this all ended up being this way yeah and then i was able yeah. to have my dad finally i introduced my dad and met with janice and terry where he can finally after all these years um shake hands with the people that looked after me while he was forced out of my life so yeah. it was it was quite yeah. a heartfelt my dad yeah. and terry and janice are very close my dad highly oh. highly respects them and I, I spent Thanksgiving yeah. at your dad's house. Yeah, he sure did yeah. this last year. That was a beautiful thing. My dad loved that. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Jackson, are, you, are any of your family still in Scientology? Uh, both my sisters, my mother. My mother is, yeah. She's still in the, well, she's no longer in the Sea Organization, but she's she's an old fragile woman now and has been geriatric out of the, out of the Sea Org. Um, and okay. um, yeah, I'm. You know, like like I'm not the only one, but I'm just one of the many children that grew up in Scientology waiting to get that phone call days, months, or years after the fact of your parents dead. Not yeah. past. They're not going to tell you gently. They're going to tell you crudely, oh, yeah, your mom's dead. Yeah. Well, I mean, but that, even... or, or not tell you at all. They, never, they didn't tell me my sister died six months before, yeah. and I found out on Facebook by, you know, I actually, well, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I was even just going to go ahead, Janice. Go ahead. Even if you're in the seal, they wouldn't tell you if you're yeah. at different locations. It's like when Annie passed, the mother didn't know. And when my mother passed, you know, it was being kept from me that she was even sick. Right. And that she was dying. So even when you're in the seal together, they don't tell you. They, there's no respect paid toward any empathy to fellow human beings. There really isn't. Right. No. If what yeah. you got to say or do has nothing to has any, if it doesn't have anything to do, what you say or do doesn't have anything to do with the activities of the organization. It just literally goes in one ear out the other. I'm actually surprised it actually does go in an ear to then yeah. go out the other because they actually have zero. Like you could be sitting there talking to them about some point of interest or some see organizational task and then go god this reminds me of this time when i was with my mom and they'll just they'll just lose interest in the conversation yeah. and even listen well it's, having a family is basically a, considered a consideration yeah you it, know? it's it's considered a in the in in our in-house i don't know where again this is another phrase to come from it's considered other fish to fry like you present the fact that you're there and building meters or holding watch or going on missions and dressing your sea org but then when you express something other than that, it's called other, you have other fish to fry. Your interests lie elsewhere. You're not focused right. 24-7, 365 right here in front of you. You're, in, you're allowing other ideas to enter your mind and you have other fish to fry. So what it is you have, what is it you have to hide? And that because of that toxicity of that thought of people finding that out about you, that you wonder this or wonder that or have interest here or interest there, you never voice that stuff. So... Yeah. Um, it just became this um, self-imposed, naughty, that's a naughty thought, for lack of other terms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it that's would right. be better to think about porn than think about that. I would comically give that as a, that is a factual fact. You wouldn't get as much trouble. Anyway, it's just, it's so crazy. It is. The mindset that it, you come to realize. Yeah, well, it's like we had Scott Campbell on and his whole problem started with him wanting to go and see his grandmother before she before died. She died. Right, isn't that crazy? And there was and then it just blew up and got bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, where he was out of control. No, he right. just wanted to go say goodbye to his grandmother. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Yep. Crazy. Right, I'm going to go to the next question here, okay? Okay. Uh, yeah. We've got uh, Melanie Johnson question. It's great to see you all again. Well, thank you for being here, Melanie. We appreciate it. I love your peeling the onion stories. Janice, your memory is amazing. Do you think that <laughs> is because of something you learned in Scientology? Well, I must say in Scientology, in auditing, you have to recall a time or go back to the beginning of the incident. So there is a lot of memory work <laughs> it really when is get, i mean it's funny yeah. to mention that janice because that is something that you constantly are always asked to you know consult your file clerk up upstairs here 
about yeah. some specifics. And it's not just a generalized idea. It's actually detailed time, place, form, and event specifics. You're always asked for time, place, form, and events. So you're always in the mindset of thinking, well, yeah, I was at the park last week. Well, what time were you at the park? What was the weather like? Yeah. How many people were there? Yeah. What were you wearing? What were the smells? So being set in that type of mindset when you're recalling memories, people yes. have told me too that I have a great memory. I'm like, I'm just me. There's nothing special about it. Yeah, but, I get the uh, same thing. Yeah, but I, I I, do humor myself by how much detail I can remember about something. I mean, Janice and I were talking the other day, and I just called her with a five-minute question. We ended up talking for two hours, it seemed. <laughs> well, at least at least an hour and a half, right, Janice? It, well, yeah, it was yeah. about an hour and 45 and minutes. <laughs> she's got her beautiful granddaughter in her lap wanting her attention, but mm. yet Janice and I were captivated in our own conversation of the so details of little specifics and memories back back at the International Beck, way back in the day. Like, I cannot believe I'm even remembering this. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's uh, some things you learned. I don't think it was a thing. It was a thing we were demanded of. It was a culture, and thus it changed our personal. It For me, it changed my character. Yeah. My character on ability to remember something and observe what I'm seeing. And, you know, I guess we were clear, weren't we, Janice? Because our... Our analytical mind was capturing information and wasn't muddied by reactive, reactive mind yeah. crap, right? <laughs> well, also, also, if you have to write a knowledge report, you got to put time, place, yeah. form, and event, you know? And Otherwise, it's a useless it, report. It, it, and, exactly. And, and you don't want to get in trouble for that, so you provide all the no. specifics as much as you can remember. Yeah. Thanks for that question, Melanie. We've got the next question here. This is Pick 61 again. Question for Jackson. Jackson, did Scientology safe point the fire stations like they did the police? If so, do you think that still happens today? Okay, quickly, I'm of the firm belief that it does not happen today because anybody on staff, if they were not involved as deeply and passionately as I was with the fire service out in Riverside County, they wouldn't know what to do. They would just trip amongst themselves. The fire department is a, although it's a public service entity, their mission statement is significantly different than law enforcement. So they are truly there to bring resolution to troubles in people's lives. Uh, and they can't leave the incident until that is met and satisfactory achieved. And then they return to quarters where law enforcement, um, they may come off as though they're there to bring resolution and, uh, to the conflict or problem you're having in your life that they responded to, but yet it turns into an investigation and therefore they can never deem it completed or closed until that investigation is clean. So it's always kind of kept open-ended. So having said that, um, did Scientology safe point? I don't think they did it in LA and I, I didn't see it. There was a recent response to the test center at the Hollywood Inn, Hollywood, uh, the, the HI there, the building that has a big tall, Scientology, green Scientology sign that's posted on the corner. You can see on Hollywood Boulevard. Um, I watched that in detail to see how the firefighters were interacting with the staff. And they were just dutifully going abo uh, 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 about their their job responsibilities. And there was not much of any interactions between firefighters and the staff. If there would have been, and if there, had, if there was, it would have been a fire captain or battalion chief uh, simply to determine uh, where was the fire at, the source of the fire, we're going to go investigate it, then they would report back to the church as to their findings. And um, they just go about their business of doing if they need to um, shelter something up, uh, board up windows because glass was taken out to ventilate, something, I don't know. It's just, it's a whole different thing. I highly suspect my first question is, I would say no. That doesn't eliminate the possibility of them showing up in a public setting such as LEPD does at a, at a gala or something to uh, um, do some volunteer raw, raw public interaction, you know, rubbing shoulders. But they've, they've historically, you can't go back and say, yeah, LA, LAFD, LA fire department, or even LA County fire was ever brought in to any public relations activity at the ant base. I used to bring this, the, the local, my captain and my firefighters out to the base to, introduce them to my wonderful staff and and introduce my wonderful staff to these wonderful firefighters and my wonderful captain. That was my mindset. And um, I felt the more information the firefighters or the fire department knew about the golden era 
and um, the building construction, which is a vital piece of information as a firefighter, how things are made. When, when the, the manufactured building was being built, before the walls were covered in sheetrock or stucco, I brought my crews in so we can see how it's built just to give us more of an idea of the inner workings. Anyways, that, that's a technical aspect, but um, um, even this gentleman who was ringing earlier, he uh, I used to take him on tours just so they can see uh, to support their desired knowledge as a firefighter. So if they do respond, they already have some working knowledge, so it's uh, it, it allows them to be more positively effective at the service that they're right. to provide. So right. there was never a, hey, why don't you come down and rub shoulders up with us and we'll feed you well and wine and dine you mentally. And then um, can you please speak about Scientology highly anywhere you go type of effort? There was never any yeah. of that. See, on the ship, we always had to safe point each of the ports. And so we'd have VIP parties on board and all the local officials would be invited. And now public relations people would mingle with them. Some crew members might mingle, you know, like the purchaser who would have to deal with the local chandler. And so it was always made sure every port we went to, there was a VIP party and they all came to the ship and there was music playing and dancing and drinking and the locals would happily go off drunk, you know, and they were yeah. like, became, became good friends. But once we came to the U.S., even in Clearwater, they were supposed to become, the idea wasn't to take over Clearwater, it was to become a part of Clearwater. Right. And and join the different communities. And that's why we even had baseball teams and, you know, the crew out there doing local doing activities and trying to become part of the community rather than just sitting there and becoming an eyesore, you know, for the locals, which is yeah. what happened in Hemet. There was never there was a certain time period, Janice. I'm glad you kind of highlighted that because I distinctly remember there was never a clear cut, at least verbalized intention or planned intention at the end base in turn uh, towards external public relation efforts it was always just to be happy great friends with our local community we like them they like us right. and um that was the way it was left and uh i gotta tell you since i've left and and firefighters of uh, all the firefighters in riverside county and in, in cal fire who came to know me over the years um they have now seen my stories, watched my videos, and are just shell shocked of what they had in their own hands, which was me screaming for help, and uh, if they'd only could have, and then they them filling me in on the bat poop crazy stories that took place after I left, like them showing up at the firehouse and literally circling for hours, waiting for me to pop out of the bushes because I was there seeking <laughs> refuge, hiding, and they were like, "What what is going on here?" And this is right. this Int Bay Sea Org staff looking for Jackson at the firehouse, and they will not believe be what they're being told by him because they feel that they're protecting me. But they're also public servants. These just the stories I was like, yeah, and they actually filed me as dead because they were told by the church um, oh. that you'll no longer be hearing from them. It was at the time Lisa McPherson was being highly publicized. So they they literally, when I called after I left, the first day I spoke to my captain, I was like, hey, Cap, this is Moorhead. And uh, he was like, who? And I said, yeah, it's Moorhead. Who? Uh, Captain, it's Gary Moorhead. And there's just this long pause. I'm like, right. hey, Cap? He goes, dude, we, we filed you. I said, what do you mean filed me? We filed you. as dead filed you. Like, you're dead. That's, right. what we were, that's what we were led to believe and told. That was a weird thing. Even this August of last year, I didn't even solicit it. I met with my, who, who's now a, high-ranking chief in Cal Fire, he even retold that story to me. He just, he could not believe that that's what he was led to believe, and they actually filed me as dead. That's a weird wow. thing as a human being to experience, where there's yeah. other, other human beings truly believing, and especially the people I was so intimately close with as a brotherhood were led to believe, and that they would never hear from Moorhead again. Right. Well, but, you know, what you were doing was safe pointing, becoming good friends with them. And that was but, through the direction and guidance of Shelly. Shelly gave me carte, carte blanche. Right. And but she, you look at all the other, the, all, look at all the other staff there yeah. who have nothing to do 
with any of the locals to the point where it's like they don't know how to deal with locals anymore. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, I remember I remember going on a leave of absence to Paul's family and she's got a guard, the mom's got a garden or this and that. I knew nothing about life outside the Sea Org. I kind of felt shy and unable to even have a conversation that there's tomatoes growing in the backyard. How do you plant them? I know, right? You, how do they, you know, how do they grow. What? Yeah. Right. And you just you just really don't understand the outside world no. and it pushes you further back by not being a part of it. Go yes, ahead, Mark. Mark. I've got another question in along the same lines. This is from Elizabeth. Are you still working or volunteering as a firefighter? Sadly, I'm not. Um, I don't have what what they call nowadays the receipts to prove it, but I do have connections that were deep within the systems that the church worked hard to um, eliminate my possibilities of being a public servant as a career. And I probably said that way more elaborately than needed, but they basically uh, shut down, they burnt the bridges and every effort I tried to put forward, they worked in and undid. It's a very, you know, it's a very sensitive working environment because the fire service is a merit-based system. You earn, you earn yourself into those positions. You start off young and you, you get the initial training. And then over the course of time, you obtain more training and you prove your capabilities and your strength and desire to be a very honorable and loving, for lack of other terms, really, not loving is not the right word, but just a very dedicated professional being a true public servant. And um, so when the language that was introduced by the church into this environment, th that would be something that I would end up fighting the rest of my career. It would follow me like a black cloud. And they knew that. That's like what you've heard uh, OSA doing to other people when they get in the workplaces. As an example, if I showed up working in a place and I get established there, the church would find out who's married to who, who's what and have flowers sent to that woman in my name. And next thing you know, you get pulled in. It's like, how can you send flowers to my wife? And this is like the wife of the CEO or something. And that would just ruin Correct. your career. Yeah. yeah. And that's what they do. So, uh, but that wasn't what was done in the fire service. It was more significant than that. But once that language is introduced, because it's such that's a right. merit, honorable based system, it's just, uh, it, once it's tainted, it's tainted forever. So, yeah. um, that that was their successful effort of but I did get twenty years of hardcore activities of volunteer firefighter. I will tell you that. Well, we thank you for your service. Today. Well, yeah. I no, was not. Thank you, Mark. I just you know people <laughs> say that, and I'm like, you know what? That was never on my mind. But I know, but uh, you know, still, I mean, I miss look, it, it takes, tremendously. Miss and it it's not on bravery. It takes real bravery, real bravery yeah. to go into a burning fire. I mean, I well, saw that one that we had at the base. And it was scary, you know, the one that was going up the hillside. I mean, uh, it moved yeah. so fast. I, I mean, the firefighters really, really are. Oh. I was on a fire down in San Diego and, and uh, drive, traveling on this road. And I look off to the right. I'm doing like 45, 50 miles an hour and the fire is out racing me. I'm like, is this really happening? And we were trying to get the head of it. But yeah. Um, yeah. No. Uh, yeah. The stories I could tell you. It's, and the funny thing is this little side note is my firefighting experience. I have never once. Out of, out of all the trauma and tragedy I responded to and seen and forced myself into of putting my hands on and in and around and bringing it up out of the, the thing and back onto the path of survival and happiness, never once did I ever have a nightmare or dream about a bad experience. I mean, I, I don't know disrespect of my fellow past, present, and current firefighters in the Brotherhood uh, I saw my share of stuff and uh, I saw a great deal of it. And it's just, it just constantly shocks me how not showing up to a muster on staff is a nightmare that would occur and rattle my soul and linger throughout the rest of that day or the next day. Um, responding to a head on collision between two people that catches fire and you see the remnants of that and dealing with the family and having to put your hands in there and pull that buddy out of the car and yeah, the whole nine yards. Never have I ever had in a nightmare. It just shocked me. I don't even know how to explain right. that. No, I get uh, it. Yeah. Spiritually, mentally, as a soul, I don't know. You know, it just it doesn't happen. So, um, well, let me, to, I've got another. 
I hope argument. I answered that lady's question that answered that. Guy's I'm sure you question. did. I'm yeah. sure you did. We got another question. Mary Kay London, she's a member of our channel. Thanks for being here, Mary Kay. We really appreciate it. Question, Jackson, did you ever feel bad or did you not give your best efforts when you were looking for people who blew? <laughs> did <laughs> I ever like, feel bad? I'm not going to look. Or did you not give your best oh, efforts? Oh, no. You, you didn't mind them. To, to say I, I did not give my best effort? <laughs> Believe me, that's one of those, again, of, that, that's a nasty thought. That if uh, if you're ever caught, like that could come up later in in a uh, confessional, so right. you never even thought of that. It's like if you were thinking that, it's like what am I not doing that I should be doing, and better go do it. Because exactly. if it does come up, at least you can answer that. I realized that I was having these lazy thoughts, you know, and I just got right up and started doing something with, it, and they would go, oh, okay, good. Um, well, you know, if feeling bad, go ahead, Janice, buddy. I still have something else. No, well, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say. I remember when Hans Sully was trying to recruit trained auditors for the Flag Service Org, and one of them had been an old time Sea Org member who was now running a mission in Holland, Hank Lahas, and oh, wow. Hans Sully wanted to get him because Hank was a class eight, and Hank was like, "Let me talk to Janice first. And he's over in Holland, and Hans Sully's trying to get him to sign up, so. And Sully comes to me and says, I need you to talk Hank into joining the flag service org. And I said, oh, all right, let me talk to Hank. And so I, I end up talking to Hank and I'm like, Hank, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> the, sea org, the sea org is not what it used to be. It's gotten worse and worse and worse. You're safer just staying and running the mission in Holland. See, and that's that was, awesome. That yeah. was a big withhold. I was like, oh, I hope nobody ever sex checks me and asks me a question that will bring this up. Yeah. See? I I never knew that story. That's just hope you listening folks understand the depths and what's your show would be rattled if you said such a thing. It's like, but Janice's honesty stuck through, you know. Um, did just just to quickly answer Mary Kay London's question, did you ever feel bad? I always felt bad about the situation at hand. It was always is upsetting to me that this person was in such turmoil that they found the need to leave. Um, and then they left in the way that they did and they were making it harder and harder for me to find them. Um, but, uh, I wasn't upset at the fact that hard they made it to made it for me and others to find them. But it was, it was just, it was bad because it started, uh, the, the real bad ones is, is the ones that would really rattle the backbone of the property such as people like Janice and Paul taking off, there's something wrong here, you know, as opposed, there's something wrong here as a general atmosphere of the place. Whereas um, somebody, a grounds crewman taking off, that's just, that's just part of the riffraff, you know, but still it was still considered important. But um, the ones that made me really feel bad is when the significant people of in, in more important positions or had a longer term interaction. And I mean, Janice was, Janice was, a part of a handful of people that built that place, that built the Sea Org, that built, that kept what what any Scientologist knows Scientology to be nowadays. If it wasn't for these people's efforts back in the day, that glorious taste in their mouth that they kept seeking more and more of Scientology wouldn't have existed. And and um, when you start seeing that chewed away, it's like when people go, "Oh, well, Heber Gents is no longer around." Well, that tells you right there the backbone of Scientology is being rattled and being right. taken out. So yeah, and we, and we Jackson, I agree with you. And we, you know, I always wondered because, you know, we left at the same time, Janice yeah. Paul and myself and Terry and Fernando had left before that. And I wondered if it rattled the cages because yeah, was someone in Dave's we were, office we were took in off the power. Yeah. We yeah. Were in the power there and uh, they took off. Well, like, wouldn't the staff go like, what the hell happened? Yeah. yeah. And we can never, yeah. we can never talk about that amongst ourselves. So it was never right. an openly spoken topic, but, um, it certainly was felt and we were all forced mentally to push on through and just fill that gap as to what happened with, Oh, they got crimes. They got withholds. They've done something wrong. We just don't know about. And yet the Dave knows. And uh, what I do know is I don't know. And um, you know, if, if he's okay with it, I'm okay with it. You know, <laughs> well, type of thing. Gary, let me ask you when you tried to leave, didn't, weren't you hiding behind a rock? when they were out looking for you? <laughs> I was actually laying down. This is a his, the, the in-depth thought process that people go through as individuals. I happened 
to do more on a more analytical basis of if I run across this, the street and lay down in the bushes, like jump into them, they won't see my trail leading into a freestanding dead weeds that are being knocked over by my simple walking through them. So I have to jump through them and then just lay there flat and I can hide in the weeds and only crush the ones that I'm actually laying on. So yeah, when I did that, the, the rover bike just literally was putting by a foot off on my shoulder and he couldn't see me because the weeds are so tall. So that viewing angle, I took all that right. into consideration. Yeah, I, you know, you from having how, chased others. Huh? Well, and I, it's, it's funny how, you know, when you're thinking about leaving, like when I escaped, yeah. you know, the first time was easy, right? But the second and third time, I actually planned it out ahead in my head. I'm thinking, oh, well, of course. Well, how am I going to get out this? You know, I thought about it two, three days in advance because you had to, because you wanted to outsmart guys. Well, that was, it wasn't the outsmarting. It was that, that was a trickery that was, well, maybe it was outsmarting, Mark. I'm not going to speak on your behalf, but. Well, I mean, just um, to get away, you know. Yeah, I mean? yeah. No, the, the level right of away. you attending to the details of what's at play once I pull this trigger. I can't just walk away like normal no. listening people think that why didn't why didn't we just walk away it's not that easy so yeah, you you want to get sideswiped by a car and pulled in yeah it? you might as well jump in the 405 during rush hour traffic you know you're going to get hit by a car yeah. rather than let's just wait until after midnight when half of society's in bed and there's half the threat you know right, um, you can sneak out <laughs> yeah i was literally counting the seconds I was doing that mathematics in my head because somehow I reached that level of intelligence on staff, never having gone to high school. Um, but I would do my calculations how fast I can travel over this distance by how long that gate would be open. So I could, from where I was doing my hard labor, if if I wanted to take off, I'd had, you know, I figured out I need to leave. Once the gate completes opening, I need to start running now. Or do I start running there when the gate first starts opening? Do I need that added time, you know? Because the moment that gate's open, it's a loose concept or loose cannon for church staff. It's an insecurity. It's too yeah. bad, in essence, the gates actually, actually they, they open and close. They can't do the Star Trek and go, <laughs> you know. Right. That would be a better security gate. So I, I literally would go figure that kind of stuff out throughout the day and calculate. And I, I, I had even realized... God, I can't go anywhere at night because I can't see. I'm, I'm not going to run around with a flashlight, nor do I want to burn myself while holding a flashlight. <laughs> it's dark out oh, there. Oh, yeah. I'll wait till there's a full moon. So that delayed it yet another month because yeah. I had to observe what time of day and what, you know, because the moon, the moon, when it cycles, it cycles at the high point at various different times on a Monday, Tuesday, when it moves during the sky, at uh, the sky at d- d- certain days. Anyways, I'd want it be to have it at its apex to maximize the light that I would have. And I, I that's how I planned my, my move. I mean, I, I'd have to go into detail of how this all came together, but yeah, I yeah. even put all well, my we, change we in do. my sock, in my shoe, so it wouldn't rattle while I ran. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, no, we, should, we should do one. We need to do another one of these, Gary, and get your details on your, yeah. on your escape. Yeah, it was a great to do, I'll tell you that. Yeah. I did it three times, yeah. Yeah. I hope well, that yeah, answered no, the more questions again. And to be honest with you, Jackson, I've never heard your escape story, so that definitely oh, okay. thing sometimes. Uh, I have around the here. table. The big, people need yeah. to hear it. Jehovah's Witness Apostate question. Janice, Mark, and Gary, did you all know Leah Remini while you were Scientologists? She was not famous then. She was in she was in the CMO, Commoners Messenger Org in Clearwater as a teenager. Um, when we were in the Sea Org, right, Janice? I mean, I never met her, but that yeah. she was like a 13-year-old or whatever in the Sea Org in Clearwater. Yeah, I think she might have been in the EPF when I showed up in Clearwater for a couple of days. And, you know, I might have just seen her and ignored her, you know. Yeah, and I never yeah. knew her as a Sea Org member. I only knew her as a um, a celebrity public. And I got to meet her. And, you know, it was never much of a social interaction because I was there with Dave and Shelley. So... As long yeah. as they were chit chatting, hanging with her, I was there with him, and you know, she asked me how we do, and that's that's about all I can tell you. But yeah. you know, we're yeah. we're we're like brother and sister now, so um, yeah. Yeah, I think the first time I met her was when I went on the aftermath found it, uh, the oh, aftermath wow. um, yeah. show. The show. Yeah. TV yeah. Show. yeah. 
you know, Jackson, it's funny. I just saw a photograph Tony Ortega posted of the uh, the Ideal Org opening in, I think it was Austin, Texas, or Chicago. I can't remember where. I think it was Chicago. And I could see, you know, they had a picture of Miscavige standing up at the podium and there was some of the crowd. But there were guys just like Secret Service agents in suits looking Yeah, out with sunglasses away. on. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. There was no like emotion on their face looking around. Service. Yeah, those are hired heaters. I call them hired heaters. Those are paid professionals carrying guns. You know, Scientology was supposed about supposed to be inclusive and include people and yeah. get them coming in. And here they are just trying to block everybody off yeah. because they have such bad public relations. It's incredible. The bad yeah. PR. Jesus, Janice. It is yeah. so the opposite of what it once was. But, it's. But you know what's the shame of it is the staff members... Uh, kept so they're so secluded from what's going on and not aware of it or they think these are just suppressive persons out there and that they better just stay inside and hide you know and yeah they're so involved in their own bubble they, just, they, they have zero social skills once they walk out that yes. door zero yes. like i need to go get a uh, uh some laundry soap at the grocery store can we go there they wouldn't know what to do if they hear other people talking about some life topic or they wouldn't know how to go ask one of the uh, assistants for assistance in the grocery store. Where can I find this? You know, it's just, it's truly, they have zero social skills. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's exactly. good to point that out. And that's yeah, I mean, usually I, the dead I, giveaway I, indicator that there's a, a plant or a sign. You're talking to a serial member of Scientologist. Yeah. Well, I don't, I think maybe during my whole time in Hammett, I went into a grocery store once, you know, otherwise I was, yeah. I, I never went to a grocery store. I yeah. didn't know how to go shopping or anything like that. It's like an Oregonian try to pump their own gas. They don't know how to do it because they've never pumped their own gas. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, you go outside of the state of Oregon. It's like, how do you do this? <laughs> well, it's just literally, I mean, for those who know the the meaning behind that statement is that's what it's like for a CEO member in their social interactions. They have zero right. social skills. They have would have no idea how to put gas in that car. Exactly. <laughs> Mark, your mic is off. We can't hear you. Yeah, sorry about that. Misha was barking. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's see what we got here. I, I was asking, in, in Oregon, do they only have first full service gas stations? I guess? Yeah, until this last year, they changed it to um, the provider, who are the, the, the gas station who provides fueling. Um, they, they at least have to have one pump where you still pull up and there's an attendant because they did not want to do away with people who had jobs and that, that's their livelihood. But, yeah. um, you know, uh, the people who chose to put this on the dockets that uh, they'd be allowed to pump their own gas, like even at Costco, um, like forever, Costco, every lane had an attendant or four or five attendants. You go to Costco, like get them down in L.A., it's everybody fighting for a nozzle. Um <clears throat> And they park at different angles here in Oregon at a Costco. It's all nicely organized and they move people through, yeah. but now they've got half the islands are self-serve and it's still heavily loaded on the, having to attend it. Somebody gets your gas, but yeah. Janice has a funny, Janice has a funny <laughs> L. Ron Hubbard gas story, gasoline story. Janice. Oh boy. Yes. And that was when we first arrived in Daytona in uh, 1975 from the ship. Hubbard went off and bought some cars and then he was he, my sister and, and Laurel were with him and um, he actually got off and drove out of the car place and he he got on the freeway going the wrong way and Laurel was like oh my god we're right. going the wrong way oh wow and then they go to get gas and he pulls up at the gas tank and he's sitting there and he's sitting there and Terry and Laurel are sitting there and then Laurel I think says uh, it says self-serve. They don't come and pump your gas for you anymore. And he gets out of the car. Those bastards. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, because it used to be that's a teenage job. You know, you pump Well, yeah. Get yeah. your windshield well, wiped, he, your oil checked and everything. Yeah. That was a... Right. Well, when he was living in the U.S. in the late 50s, before he moved to St. Hill, yeah, it was full service. Yeah. And so here we are now in 1975, and he's not driven on the freeways or anywhere in the U S and in 20 plus years. So he's sitting there waiting for an attendant. Yeah. See, again, even Hubbard had his own poor social skills, right? <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> All right. We got another question. This is from Danielle Chamberlain. Hi, Danielle. Good to see you here. 
Question, do you think Scientology informed how you reacted when seeing tragedy in a fire? Did you act more cold than someone who had never been in? Meaning when you dealt with the yeah. bodies and the fire and all When that. I was a firefighter, I was fulfilling my personal passion of being a firefighter in life. Um, I carried with me nothing of Scientology. It was, you know, that may sound odd, but I was not looking for opportunities to provide an assist to somebody in tragic. I had a responsibility and an obligation to serve the public and um, non-judgmentally in any situation and respond to their tragedy and help bring them out of it and see to it that they were put on the path of help and recovery. So um, that is a very interesting question, uh, Daniel, in that um, you probably would assume that I was trying to sneak in an assist every now and then. Um, never once did I ever do that because that was not... And again, that was part of my, my waking up eventually. My interaction at the firehouse really helped me come back and bang my head against the wall. It's like, well, it's okay there, but why is it not okay here? And I, I did have to fight the my fire captain and firefighters. I did have to um, battle in my own head that uh, because we were always informed that anybody outside these gates and perimeter fence of the imp base are sad, poor souls. And um, I never thought that of my firefighters because I witnessed the fact they are genuinely good human beings that would always give their life for the life of another in an effort to help that person. Right. And that is a that is a very to witness that. I mean, that's how the firefighters get along so well because they're also there on a common purpose. But um, yeah. uh, do you think Scientology informed? I'm not exactly sure how that that fits in. Informed how. Like informed me how I reacted. Yeah, in other um, words, like your Scientology training or processing. Yeah. Does that help I did you? one time. Um, I, I responded to an uh, an incident off to the west at the Sanderson and Gilman intersection, which Janice and Paul know of, before it was built out to what it is today. It used to be a very risky intersection traffic. It was at the foot of mm. high-speed traffic coming out of the hill, and it was a challenge just trying to get across to continue on to the freeway. But... I responded to a, an accident out there that this girl was unconscious and I did an unconscious person assist and she came out and I was shocked. You know, I just think it was a series of coincidences that I was saying what I said and I touched her or she finally was starting to come out of her confusion and woke up. But um, because I gave her the commands of the assist, she came out of it and just stared at me in my eyes and I just felt that I was in touch with that soul. So... Uh, I decided, uh, and then my guards were controlling traffic and, you know, look at us, look at us, we're the Scientology here, um, putting order in dis disarray, dismay here. Um, so I took the time to write this thing because at the time there was a lot going on at the base and I figured, well, COB, you know, Dave is filled with so much bad news. Let me just write this report and give him some good news of what me and my, my guards did to help somebody locally. And I wrote all this up and that was on the heels of the life orientation course LLC that is designed for you to figure out what your hat in life is. And I had figured yep. out that mine was to be a servant to others and help others. So I was completely feeding into that happily. Um, so I wrote this whole thing up to him and um, I just thought it was cool and that, that we did this and we applied Scientology and, and, and um, to my surprise um, that night, there was a base briefing, brief muster, or maybe it was I submitted on a Friday and it happened to be on a Saturday. It was actually on a Saturday when he'd come down after our renos. Um, and uh, he pulled up and he goes, I have this goldenrod to read. He tells the whole staff and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have more people to watch. And he begins to read what I wrote up and he, re re he reprinted what I submitted to him as a letter of happiness and a little... A little shining star for the, your day, sir. Um, and he read out exactly what I did and what my guards did. And the the results that this girl actually, when she was being transported off to the hospital, she wrote her phone number. I gave her, she wanted me to have her number to stay in touch with her. So she wrote it down on my hand. And he, he read all that. And he goes, you know, Jackson is hereby promoted to uh, officer, lieutenant, midshipman, or whatever it was. I got promoted from a zero to a hero that night and two of my other guards got half promotions but it was a it was you know not simply just because my own name is attached to it but it was my 
witness to the first time that that was such a rare thing that Dave ever acknowledged anybody publicly of having done something good and promote them. I mean, this is way outside of um, Sea Org Day, which is where promotions happened, right? You would work towards yeah. that one day a year to present mm -hmm. yourself yeah. and hopefully get promoted. I just randomly got promoted on any given work day per se. And um, next thing you know, I was a Sea Org officer because of this act. It's like, well, shit, I've been doing this all along. I should have done this long ago was my thought. You know, I'd be a captain by now. But, uh, <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But it was just, it was fun as a memory because I gave him a piece of good news uh, amongst the shit that I felt that he was forced to deal with and handle every day. You know, I just figured he yeah. could use a little bit of good news and that was the result of it. So, um, I, I just, I will repeat that. I, I was so happy with myself that I never did. I ever introduce the, the ways, the technology or the ways in the reasons of Scientology and the Sea Org into the fire service whatsoever. Um, was not the culture, not the type of people, not the environment right. to do such a thing. And uh, it no, wasn't they even, have their job and they do it. Do they? And they they have yeah. figured that out long, long, long ago. That wheel's yeah. been rolling well before I got here. I don't need to try to reshape it and reinvent it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Go ahead. Mark. I just want. We got a couple more questions, uh, Janice. Don't start anything else um, right now, but because we're going to wrap up here. But a okay. uh, question here uh, for uh, Love Maddie, question Jackson. Did you already say if you've were if, if you been disconnected from your mother and sisters, did they disconnect from you? Yes, I, um, I haven't talked to my family except for my father since 2000, whenever the St. Pete time, whenever I went public at the St. Pete's time, they cut me off. Probably 2009, something like 2009, that. 2009, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. And then Jehovah's Witness apostate question, Janice. Why did your dad divorce oh. your mom? How did your dad react when she died? Well, actually, my mom divorced my dad. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was only, well, I thought they divorced when I was 10, but I found out later that they actually didn't divorce in England. They got divorced many years later in, um, in LA around 1973 so that she could marry Heber. So, um, but they, they weren't, a, they weren't a, uh, a couple for all those years from my age of 10. And, um, but my dad and became, he was like my mom's best friend. Even when she was married to Heber, they were always very close and good friends. When she needed help at Celebrity Center, setting it up, didn't have finances. He bought her all the folding chairs that she needed for the stage, for the, performance room and you know for the course rooms and stuff like that so he was always there for her and when she was dying um he had been in australia when he got word and he came back from australia and went straight to clearwater where she was and he was right there with my sister and his girlfriend kay gonslin when mom passed away yep which is a funny small world janice i learned of kay gonslin <laughs> Um, that lady got around. I'm not saying that to taint anything. It's just, uh, I found out she had many relations with a lot of significant people at, like Jeff Walker, you probably know about Jeff. Yeah. Jeff was a very good friend. Um, yeah. But it yeah. was just that whole Scientology in the world, you know, people end up, you know, falling in love, um, in the, in the wrong places, but it's just, it's a small net world. So it's not unusual to find a one guy or one gal attached to one person, or many people, it's just, that's just a, it's, it's not a, I'm not trying to say that it's a promiscuous environment. It's just, um, by right. default, uh, your interests only lie to draw from the Scientology community. Right. So, right. You're not going to, yeah. you're not going to start a relationship with somebody who's outside of Scientology. No. Yeah. Well, Kay had been, became friends with <clears throat> Jeff because Jeff, Jeff had become friends with one of her friends. She was in the, it, she was a dentist in Louisiana. And there was a group of dentists and Jeff ended up marrying your mother-in-law, your past yep. mother-in-law. Yep. And um, so that's how Jeff got into that circle. And so after dad and Kay broke up and when Jeff broke up from uh, Sue and left the Sea Org, he went to Kay for help. Kay, yep. And, yep. Uh, I, like I'm and saying, Jeff. is this... Even so yeah. much, I was finding this out while I'm doing my job in the Sea Org, and then I go home and visit my new family and uh, 
find out that in the dentist world, because my ex-wife's father is very prominent in the dentistry world, and that's where she hailed from. And I'm like, wow, man, this woman's gotten around out here. <laughs> <laughs> that's only two. <laughs> well, yeah. It just was fascinating, so that's all. Okay, I got two more. Uh, one's a quick question, and then, then we've got the final question here, okay? okay? This one's from Danielle Chamberlain. Question, a bit off topic, but Mark, what year did the gray moss get torn down? I don't uh -huh. remember. I think it was before we left in 1990. Janice, you would know better than me. Were you oh, in Clearwater? Oh, yeah. Was <sighs> I was in Clearwater. Um, well, I remember going back there in 78. And it was still there because my dad oh, yeah. had his vitamin store in there in 78. And well, we then, eventually bought it. They eventually bought it. And then it was torn down and just, it was right. Well, when I was, here. when I was there in, um, 88, it was gone. It was torn down by then. And I know I was back in Clearwater around 80 and I think it was still there at that time. Yeah. And for so the somewhere between 80 and 88. For the viewers that don't know, the Gray Moss was right across the street from the Port Harrison Hotel. And actually, it's in the location where now that big Scientology super power delivery building. super building is, right? But the Gray Moss was like this old, rundown, wooden hotel, flea bag hotel. And, and we used to call it the Gray Mass, not the Gray Moss. Yeah, and, with uh, lots they were, of ghosts. And there were lots of senior citizens that lived there and there were people would die in there all the time. And so there'd be ambulances showing up to take the people away. But it was such an eyesore that eventually Scientology bought it. And like I said, they leveled it and then they, it was empty until they decided to build that, uh, you know, delivery building. Yeah. Kind of like what the Hacienda is turning into nowadays. <laughs> yeah. But they, but they do maintain it. It's just uh, yeah. the, the history and memories attached to the Great Moss is the Hacienda picked up <laughs> and yeah. carried on. And then the last question I've got here is question for each of you with all the not so good while in Scientology, do you have funny memories, stories that stick out every time we get together? We have yeah. funny stories. And every time we talk and Janice talks to Jackson for five minutes and it's an hour and a half, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that would be a prime, you know, clear cut example of, what it's like yeah so, yes. no there's too many there are too many to mention. we definitely had yeah, good times the time. yeah they're, they're yeah. not the good times that you would think of in today's average society where um you know you you could laugh about some fault or some incident with your boss or the ceo of the company and live be able to live with that and and say that to their face and everybody just has a good laugh it's just the little things that happen amongst ourselves and um yeah there was there was there was good times. I mean, plus plus some of the outrageous things that happened, we laugh yeah. about them now because they were so yeah. outrageous. Yeah, it's go, their outrageous the stories that, that we relate that we laugh more about <laughs> than the little isms, you know. Like uh, you That's know, right. I mean, one example is Mark Headley. You guys all know that he's in the yeah. Depeche Mode pretty heavily. So somebody wrote on the dusty end of a car once, "DM rules," <clears throat> and what do you think is going to happen? Right. Dave's driving around the base. Well, it happened. And I got called down there one day and there's Shelly and him sitting on a bike at the ass end of this car. And they're going, Jackson, what the hell is this? And I laughed and I said, I know exactly what that means, sir. That means that's Mark. That's Mark who really loves the band Depeche Mode. He goes, go get him. So Dave was trying to find out if it was actually, that was Mark praising Dave on in the dust writings on the ass end of a car. <laughs> Or is this, and then he had Marky right in. So I had to go get, and he sat there, he and Shelly sat there and waited while I went and got Mark. I mean, he was. And let me guess, Mark was praising DM. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Mark truly really gave it in his Mark way. It's like, ah, oh, sir. No, that's me. That's a Depeche mode. But I know what was going on. The wheels turning in Mark's mind. Yeah, asshole. Yeah. I really, I really bend the knee to you that I write your name on the ass end of a car. Yeah. <laughs> that's right so see that that's would be an, our conversation would be an, an example in, of mm -hmm. answer to your question so yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we've had many a dinner since leaving and it's yeah. just jackson holding court and we're just laughing our heads off you know <laughs> what i mean it's just funny you know because jackson has a lot of funny stories of things that happened that we never <laughs> heard about you know well i always but, throw humor yeah. into the tragedies i was forced to be part yeah. of but yeah <laughs> um, i remember even carrie gleason because I knew him not as much as Janice and others knew, but my perspective and interaction with him, 
um, and then meeting him years later at Janice's daughter's wedding, um, you know, he had the people just laughing because he was that, that type of nature guy to do that with people. So yeah. that's right. All right. Well, we've reached the end here, everybody. We want to thank you all for watching. And uh, we've got some, please subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And please subscribe to Jackson's channel. Uh, you know, it helps us get our story out in the YouTube algorithm. So we really appreciate it if you would subscribe and also hit that like button and notification button. And that's just a usual thing that happens. If you've got any questions or you want to ask, uh, have any comments or opinions, please ask in the comment section. We check them all the time and we will answer you. And we want to thank you for that. And then also, if you want to donate to our, co our channel, you can buy us a coffee. Go down in the description of the video. There's a link there. You click on it and you can buy us one, two, three, four. How many? ever coffees you want all the money that we get from the you know donations it just goes right back into the channel um you know so that we can provide better better shows and things like that so anyway we appreciate any support wow. cool. that people have and um anyway and i wanted to mention as well one uh, one more thing janice before you go we've got some great interviews coming mm -hmm. up here you know we just finished up one with john mclean again uh who who spoke out against scientology in canada for years uh part four that's going to come out this week and then we're interviewing some other people that i'm not going to mention yet because it'll be a nice surprise when it comes out and uh then Janice has a special interview that we're going to do tomorrow with somebody that she's known for many wow. years. So anyway, so please stay tuned to our channel. Um, you know, we're trying to tell the history, talk about the abuse, and, uh, you know, keep keep on keeping on. Go ahead, Janice, what are you going to say? Yeah, Russ T., the answer to your question is yes. What was this question? <laughs> it sounds as though he she knows. just wanted to put that out there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he had a question, and I'm oh. answering it. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> okay, Jackson, have you got anything else you want to mention? Anything you're doing? No, just to, to support your oh, statement no. more further of that. The purpose, minimally, why I'm here is to help people, help fill in the gap for people what the culture was like. Uh, having been, I was at the Imp base pretty much in my entire time as a sewer. I didn't run off like you folks did to go on missions or to go to Florida to go do this or go to wherever to do that. Pretty much 365, 24-7, I was at that base in my entire um time there so i i had come to realize that i feel i could share and help people better understand how the culture to what it is today the fearful culture that exists in scientology and as being a scientologist for fear of saying something i saw that how that stuff developed in its own way during the years that i was there and it it, it existed before i got there of course but it was seriously accelerated and then pounded into people's mind with hardcore steel efforts uh, to create a very toxic culture and um, uh, people are always, I mean, how, how, how could, how come we just didn't leave? How come we just didn't do this? Well, that just, that's what I feel I can help fulfill is a better understanding as to how and why perfectly good, fun, loving people could fall for such a thing and be involved so deeply and dedicatedly. And, um, you know, the higher, the higher up you go in Scientology, the harder the fall was the, always the internal thing so uh we would get we were in an environment we just got more and a lot you'd get in trouble and then some people come along and put some stink on it and um made our experience that much worse so uh that's that's what i have to support that that's what i'm hopeful to build fulfill people's better understanding of okay Thanks for saying that, Jackson. We appreciate yeah. it. We want to have you back. We'd love to talk about your escape. I, I think that would make a great video. I've never heard your escape story. And, and uh, you know, that it was that pretty would, significant, people, Mark. I'll tell you that. that. Not to yeah. over, sure undo and override anybody else's experience, but for me. No, was, I'm sure it was because of who you were. I, I understand yeah. completely. He knew the tricks. All right, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all right everybody. Uh, that's all. That's the show. Until the next time. Uh, we'll see you later. Thanks bye for bye. coming. Bye. <laughs>